what I've done. Written by Night Breeze. Read by no one and nobody. Chapter One I woke with a start, fear pumping through my brain as my eyes rapidly scanned the room around me. I seemed to be in a standard hospital room, complete with a bed, heart monitor, lights, and windows. It even had a bedpan at the end of my bed, though I didn't remember ever using it. I wasn't sure why, but something felt off about the room around me. The shadows were lengthening, and I could hear a creaking noise somewhere underneath me. Then, without warning, I felt a hand clamp over my mouth preventing me from calling out for help. I felt something creep closer to my ear, its hot breath searing my neck as it drew closer, the smell of reeking sewage and death. You can never skin me, it said, its voice grating across my nerves, eating at my very soul. It then pulled me from my bed, dragging me by my shoulders as it made its way towards the window. I screamed as it picked me up by the scruff of my hospital gown, its long claws digging into my flesh, as it manhandled me to my feet. I couldn't see it in the darkness of the room around us, but I could make out a basic humanoid shape as my eyes became level with its own. Let me go! I screamed as it slammed me against the window, my aching shoulders shouting at me in protest. You never... You are full of delectable sources of entertainment, it said as it gently traced a claw down my face. So many people you've killed, and so many still remain. It drew closer, its horrible face suddenly revealed in the moonlight behind me. You and me, we are partners, murderers until the bitter end, it said, its fang-filled mouth turned up into a smile, while its pitch-black, pupilless eyes stared into my soul. We don't deserve a bed. We don't need one. We're animals, looping to the dark, craving blood for our wine and flesh for our bread. And we shall have it. No, please, no. You're gone. They got rid of you. I pleaded with it as I fought valiantly against its grip. It then pushed me through the window, letting go as it did so. I fell, screaming all the way, until I finally landed with a thud onto the hard dirt road beneath me. You'll never be rid of me. It whispered in my ear as the screaming started. I lifted my head and, everywhere I looked, I could see ponies with their faces twisted into looks of horror and disgust. I held my hand out to the nearest pony, a familiar orange-colored one, as I begged her for help. No! Stay back, you monster! She screamed as she turned and bolted. I barely registered her words, though, when I realized that I no longer had proper hands, but foot-long claws at the ends of each of my fingers. All around me, I heard the same thing, repeated over and over. Monster! 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 I heard those words, repeated over and over, never letting up, even when I turned and ran, attempting with all my might to escape the accusing glares all around me. I turned and ducked into a nearby building, hoping to escape the mobs, only to run headlong into a sight I wished that I would never see again. I had somehow stumbled into a house full of mirrors. Every reflection I saw was a brutal reminder of what I had become. A murderer. I turned to run, to find some place where I could escape from my own soulless glare, only to run headlong into a tall, dark blue pony with both wings and a horn. I jolted awake, sweat pouring down my brow as I tried to sit upright. I was foiled in my attempt, however, because I was still tied down to the hospital bed with padded restraints. I let my head fall back into my pillow as I desperately tried to still my pounding heart, my breath sounding ragged in my ears. 
It was just a dream, I said as my new eyes glanced around the empty room. The room was brighter than in my dreams, but still not bright enough to hurt my freshly formed eyes. The heart monitor was there, as was everything else from my dream. The only thing that the room was lacking was a terrifying monster ready to throw me out the window. I breathed out a sigh of relief as I let my body relax. After what seemed like no time at all, I was fast asleep. Chancellor Gustav's claws clicked against the stone floor as he entered the meeting hall, his posture straight and imposing. He quickly noticed that all the other delegates had already arrived, though the lunar princess seemed to be absent. Ah, Chancellor Gustav, so good of you to join us, Princess Celestia said as she motioned to a nearby chair. Always a pleasure, Your Highness. Though I am curious as to why your messenger made this meeting seem so urgent. Gustav said as he took the indicated seat. It almost sounded as if you were going to war. That may not be so far from the truth, Celestia said ominously. This immediately got everybody's attention. I'm sorry, but who are you declaring war against? Speaker Silverback asked as he leaned forward onto the table. The Minotaur's expression was incredulous, almost as if he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Equestria hasn't started a war in over a thousand years, the last one being when you sealed the King of Shadows beneath the ice of the North. Celestia nodded in acknowledgement of the Minotaur ambassador. You are quite right. Rarely do we go to war, and even rarer are we the originators of the aggression. This is a completely different scenario, however, she said as she opened the folder in front of her. This may take some time to fully explain, and many of the things that I am about to tell you may very well be beyond belief. Rest assured, however, that everything you are about to hear is the truth. However, if you still doubt my words, know that I have proof to strengthen my story. With this... Celestia started to levitate a number of photos towards the attending dignitaries. As many of you remember, about six months ago, an object fell from the heavens. I remember it well. Your official statement of that was that it was some kind of meteorite. Are you telling us that it was something else entirely? Chancellor Gustav asked as he took the proffered picture. The photograph seemed to depict a burning ball of fire streaking through the night sky. It was indeed. When my troops arrived at the scene, what they found was disturbing, to say the least, Celestia said as she handed out a few more pictures. Gustav picked up his copy of the offered photographs, only to recoil a second later. What was depicted on the pictures was a long metallic vessel of some sort, though it looked badly damaged from the crash it had sustained. Surrounding the craft were a number of mutilated bodies, clearly the results of some kind of horrific battle. This was not why he recoiled, though. Gustav had served in the Griffin Imperial Army, so he was no stranger to the horrors of war. It was the two races that were involved in the conflict that caused him such distress. One side seemed to be some sort of quadrupedal insect-like race, each of them having four arms, which ended in a three-fingered claw, many of which gripped the stock of a weapon that bore a passing resemblance to a griffin crossbow. Their heads looked a little on the small side, but that was probably due to the large mandibles and the antenna that adorned each of their heads. Each of them wore an odd-looking uniform, gray in color with red accents. However, some also wore a strange kind of armor over the uniform in an identical color scheme. Gustav was half expecting their eyes to be compounded and lidless, but was surprised in his expectation. Each of the creatures bore a striking set of eyes that featured no iris, but instead just a pupil surrounded by a single solid color. The colors of these eyes seemed completely random, though he was hardly surprised at that, considering the color diversity that he encountered every day amongst the equestrians. As monstrous as these creatures appeared, though, the ones that they fought were the stuff of nightmares. They had thin, emaciated frames, that bore a distant likeness to the great apes that roamed the jungles of the far south. Each was naked, 
fully showing off every detail of their disgusting form. Their pallid skin seemed to be completely hairless, revealing every gash, scrape, and burn that they had received with alarming detail. Many of them had foot-long claws bursting out of the ends of each of their fingers, though each of them possessed much shorter claws at the ends of each of their toes. Along with the spines on each of the creature's back were a number of short, sharp spikes, giving the creatures a faintly dragon-esque look. Their soulless black eyes seemed to be completely lidless, while in the center of their flat faces there wasn't a nose, so much as there was a gaping black hole. Combined with its inch-long interlocking fangs that lined its lipless maw, the whole look of the creature appeared to be that of an engine of death. What is this? Silverback asked in horror. Exactly what it appears to be, Celestia said as she gestured towards the pictures. Six months ago, aliens crash-landed on equestrian soil. Why have you not told us about this before now? Silverback demanded as he slapped an angry fist into the marble table in front of him. Were you perhaps planning on studying and weaponizing this new discovery, intending to turn it upon us all? Calm yourself, Silverback. If Celestia wanted to conquer your nation, she would have done so a long time ago. She wouldn't even have to resort to force, either. All she would have to do is ensure that the sun's strength was ever so slightly stronger as it passed over your island nation, Gustav said ominously. It would be so easy for Celestia to seize power, and yet she never does. Celestia could control the whole world if she wanted to, but ever since the rise of the Sisters after the Chaos Wars, Equestria has only declared war once, and that was for a very, very good reason. There is a reason why Equestria has so many allies, and why it has spent so many years in peace. At these words, Mouthpiece Ebele leaned forward and brought her hoofs together in front of her. The Chancellor speaks the truth. Equestria would never be so uncouth. Though she shares this knowledge late, I will give her words great weight, Zebra said, as Silverback sat back and grumbled to himself while he folded his arms. Belle did not notice this, however, since her eyes never strayed from the photograph in front of her. Tell me, did any survive the crash, or were they all reduced to ash? Not all died from wounds sustained in the crash, Lady Ebele. Many of these wounds appear to have been made by either dragonfire or by the claws that the ape-like monstrosities bear, Gustav said as he looked closer at the picture. You are correct. We have spent a lot of time and resources examining the ship and the bodies for clues, and it appears that a great battle was fought for control of the vessel, ultimately leading to the deaths of almost all that were involved, Celestia said as she flipped through the folder in front of her a little bit more. As for your valid concerns of us turning what we find into a weapon, Speaker, let me just say that the craft is far more complex than anything my scientists have ever seen. If we had a thousand years to study the thing, we would only have barely scratched the surface on what that thing can teach us. Hold on. Go back a second. The deaths of almost all involved. Does that mean what I think it means? Gustav said as he leaned forward. It does indeed. At first, we had assumed that both sides had been wiped out during the struggle, but about ten days ago, we were proven wrong. Celestia answered, as she closed the folder in front of her with a snap. One of the aliens survived the fight and the subsequent crash, and has been living in the Whitetail Woods ever since. At this, Silverback leaned forward, clearly interested. I take it that you have caught the alien, then. Have you been able to interrogate it? Find out how each Starcraft works? He asked as a fire burned in his eyes. I think the more important question is which type of alien survived. If it was one of these bug-like aliens, I could see it responding to an interrogation. But these apes, they don't even look sapient. Gustav said as he tossed the photo in his claws onto the table. Those things are just flat-out monsters. And that is where you are wrong, my good Chancellor. One of the ape-like creatures was the only survivor. And from what we have been able to gather, it is also extremely intelligent. 
Celestia said sadly. From what we were able to learn from him, he and his brothers and sisters were abducted and mutilated into monstrosities. The insectoids then used a form of mind control to turn their creatures into puppet soldiers, unable to break from their master's will. Yet somehow their control magic failed, and the monsters turned upon their masters. Gustav finished for her. How do you know it wasn't lying? Celestia just shook her head at this. We don't, though the evidence we have all points towards the creature's story being true. It has had several opportunities to seriously maim and devour My Little Ponies, but has refrained from doing so, even going so far as to return an injured mare home at great personal risk, she said, as the attending diplomats' faces became masks of impartiality. Not only that, but we have autopsied the remains of his kinsmen, and we have found a large number of devices that have been surgically implanted into their flesh, one of them directly into the subject's brain. This statement seemed to have a chilling effect upon the assembled diplomats. However, Celestia wasn't finished yet. On top of that, about seven days ago, he was attacked by a group of four insectoids. He was badly wounded in the fight, while his attackers did not survive. We think that they were part of some sort of recovery team and were sent to either kill or capture the escaped slave, she said as she pulled more photos from her envelope. Luckily, Luna had left two soldiers watching over the creature. They were able to rescue it and bring it back to Canterlot for treatment. Wait, you mean to tell me that you are currently housing an alien fugitive? One that his former captors seem bent on recovering? Silverback asked as he rose from his seat. That is the long and short of it, Celestia said with a bow of her head. We are doomed, Gustav said as he slumped back into his chair. If you're enjoying this reading, consider checking out the non-copyright infringement version available on Amazon Prime. See link in video details for more information.